the first of these classes on UCC history and polity. The idea is to do this over a five week uh, period of time. So this week we'll talk about um, the antecedents to the UCC. The United Church of Christ is the result of different denominations coming together. So this class will talk about those different denominations and what their characteristics are. Uh, next week, we'll look at the actual merger itself. Uh, it was not an easy process. <laughs> and the uh, discussions around the merger have some um, important implications for the UCC today. And then the next class, we'll look at the UCC since the merger. Uh, the merger was in 1957. And then we'll look at the actual, we'll look a little closer at the polity of the UCC. And then the last class, uh, we'll be looking at the future of the UCC. So uh, that's the way I've decided to break it down. And uh, again, maybe as we go along, things will go in a different direction. And if it does, that's totally fine. Um, the whole purpose of this is to try and help all of you uh, get to know the denomination a little bit better. And if you have any questions about the denomination, uh, again, I'd be happy to answer them. I know Lynette would have, be happy to answer them too. So um, anyway, without, without further ado, let's, let's jump right in. So, um, the UCC is a very interesting mix, uh, and there are a lot of things that make up the UCC today. And actually, as we go through the story and talk about it, you'll see that um, Bering actually fits quite well into this whole contemporary mix of the UCC. Um, again, I think you'll be interested to see how everything's developed over time. But the denomination was originally, as I said, the result of the merger of four separate denominations um, to form the UCC. And these four denominations um, each have certain characteristics that I think if you really want to understand the denomination, it's useful to understand these characteristics and this history. Because again, I'm a huge fan of history. And one of the reasons I'm a huge fan of history is because I think it shows up uh, in our lives in all sorts of ways. Um, and if you don't know history, then uh, a lot of things happen that you just plain don't understand why they're there. But when you actually understand the history, you're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. I, I, I get it now. So. Um, now, before I begin, I have, to, I have to be honest about a bias that I have. Um, and it's just, I, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, we all have certain biases. I grew up in a congregational church. One of, the, one of the four denominations that formed the UCC was the Congregationalists. I grew up in a congregational church. Um, my ancestors came over <laughs> in the Great Migration. Uh, which we'll talk about. Um, I went to a congregational high school, a congregational college, congregational seminary, and I've served nothing but congregational churches. So I have a slight bias <laughs> of those four things that we'll talk about for the congregationalists. So I, I'll try and like restrain myself so that when we talk about this, I don't just talk about the congregationalists, but the other three groups as well. Um, but I just want to apologize up front that you're probably going to hear more about the congregationalists than you would from a different person <laughs> giving a similar course. But that's just, this is where I'm that's just where I'm coming from. Um, so without further ado, let's, uh, let's hop right into some history, some fun history. Uh, and again, if there are any questions, please ask, because if you have a question, I bet other people do too. So I'll take, I'll take each of these four traditions one at a time uh, in a row. And as we go along again, let's just jump in, have a discussion. Um, I know all of you have some really interesting background and information, otherwise you wouldn't be on this uh, Zoom call right now. So the Congregationalists. Um, congregationalists are a group that came from uh, the old Puritans and Pilgrims. So yes, at First Congregational here in Houston, uh, we have a Pilgrim Sunday. And yes, I do get dressed up like a pilgrim to preach every Sunday for Pilgrim Sunday. <laughs> um, now, what are the Pilgrims? You might, I'm, I guarantee you studied them in history, um, Pilgrims and Puritans. Um, for those of you for whom it's been a little while, it's interesting to see their background because it tells a lot about the denomination. So the English Reformation, as you recall, was started by uh, Henry VIII, when Henry VIII uh, wanted to, to divorce Catherine of Aragon and, and marry Anne Boleyn. There were obviously other factors that were involved in the creation of the Church of England. Uh, that was the precipitating factor, but uh, the Reformation, of course, had begun in 1517, and by the 1530s, uh, the Reformation was already in full swing on the continent. And so Henry, um, prompted by his advisors, uh, prompted by uh, some debts that he had to pay, <laughs> <laughs> decided to create the Church of England, seize all of the monastic lands for himself, conveniently, um, eventually, again, this was over several years, um, and form a new church. But again, Hen Henry, for those of you who know, um, had formerly been called the defender of the faith by the Pope, and was someone who wasn't all that ardent of a reformer, 
So the Church of England wasn't all that different from the Roman Catholic Church uh, before it. Um, when Henry died, he was replaced by his only son, uh, Edward. Uh, and when Edward came to the throne, he was a minor. And when Edward came to the throne, his advisors, who basically ran the country for him, were people who had been heavily influenced by the Reformation on the continent. And so these people started to take England in a pretty aggressive, more reformed direction, more Protestant direction. Uh, they reformed the prayer book, um, it changed around a whole bunch of different practices within the church. All that was going, you know, full, full scale um, until Edward died rather unexpectedly as a teenager. Um, when Edward died, he was replaced by his half-sister uh, named Mary. And Queen Mary, uh, who had married Philip uh, of Spain, was an ardent Catholic. And when she became queen, uh, she brought all of England, of course, back to the Catholic fold. Uh, and in the process, burned about 300 Protestants at stake and earned the name Bloody Mary, uh, from which we get our cocktails uh, that we occasionally enjoy on Sundays. So Mary, uh, only is, she's only on the throne for five years, though, because as the Protestants say, she was then punished by God, um, and she has cancer and dies. And then she's replaced by her half-sister, Elizabeth. Now, when Queen Elizabeth comes to the throne in 1558, uh, she's someone who, uh, for very good political reasons, if you've ever seen the movie Elizabeth with Kate Blanchett, they, they touch on some of this stuff. Now, uh, for very good political reasons, Elizabeth uh, wants an end to these religious fights. And the way that she calls an end to these religious fights is she says, we're going to carve out a middle way between the reformers on one side and the Roman Catholics on the other. We're creating this media via um, of the Church of England. And again, the biggest pressure during this comes from uh, the Catholic side as she, uh, you know, a, a very young um, and uh, very attractive Daniel Craig in the movie Elizabeth is like one of these Jesuits who's trying to undermine the queen. Uh, for those of you who are Daniel Craig fans. But it turns out the other side wasn't very happy either. So the reformers in England, because again, when, when, when Queen Elizabeth took over, or Queen Mary took over, there were a whole bunch of Protestants who fled the country. They didn't want to end up at the stake. Where'd they go? They went largely to Geneva, which is where John Calvin was. So when these people came back when Elizabeth was queen, they came back as ardent Calvinists. And they wanted to see Queen Elizabeth bring the Church of England to being Calvinist. This group of people that were sort of that were in the Church of England and wanted to make the church more Calvinist, more reformed in various ways, that group of people became these uh, Puritans and pilgrims. Uh, they weren't content with just splitting the difference between the Catholics and the reformers. That's not the way to get truth, according to them. Um, now, this group, th there were several different aspects to this group that were important. One, of course, are these separatists. Um, why is this relevant? Because uh, the question is, what makes a church church? What makes a church? What is church? Different people have different answers uh, over time. Uh, you know, a classic answer is, oh, a church is... Uh, something that's in the, in, the, in the apostolic succession from Jesus through the apostles and the bishops to the present day. That's church. You needed bishops in parishes. Maybe church is where the word of God is preached, very Lutheran response. Well, church for these early separatists is a gathering of the visible saints together, bound by a covenant. And so the Church of England, according to the separatists, is not a valid church. And these separatists uh, were persecuted by Queen Elizabeth. Some of them were actually hanged by Queen Elizabeth, executed. Um, and they ended up fleeing to Holland. And that's the group that formed the pilgrims who came over in 1620. The much larger, much more significant group of people were not separatists. They did not want to separate from the Church of England. They wanted to reform the Church of England from within and make it more Protestant. Um, and this group became increasingly influential. And by the time you get to the 1620s, um, this group has leading positions in parliament and leading positions in the gentry class. And there's lots of pressure because then you have King Charles II. Again, maybe you remember this from history, maybe not. King Charles II becomes king. Um, his uh, archbishop, his wife is Catholic. Um, his archbishop of Canterbury that he names eventually is William Laud. Uh, before that, he named Bishop of London. Uh, and he's an arch-Anglo-Catholic. Arch Anglo uh, they start persecuting Puritans who have pulpits in England, and you have major discontent 
which leads to Puritans um, deciding, it was Puritans deciding in 1629 to go over to uh, New England and found a new colony. Uh, this becomes the great Puritan establishment um, led by John Winthrop and others. Now, when the Puritans came over, it was not like the Pilgrims. So again, the Pilgrims were not particularly significant. They just weren't. They became significant in the 19th century when America wanted to find a founding myth. The Pilgrims just weren't very significant at the time. The Puritans, however, were. And when they came over to the US, they didn't come over like many people did. They didn't come over as, as poor and, un, and, un, and un, un, uneducated. Uh, they came over with a whole bunch of money and they came over with a lot of fancy degrees because they had a mission and their mission was they thought that if it, they could come over to New England and make a perfect biblical commonwealth, that people in England would see how amazing Massachusetts and Connecticut are, see the error of their ways and then change. That was the idea. Massachusetts and Connecticut were established to be the perfect theological, the perfect uh, theological enterprise, biblical enterprise. It was going to be perfect, and everyone was going to see it and be like, oh my gosh, that's, what we, that's really what we wanted all along. So there's one of the things that's significant about this is that deeply embedded in this congregational mindset is the idea of trying to make this world into the kingdom of God. There was no separation of church and state as we think of it today. There was insofar as the magistrates were different from the clergy. The churches and magistrates had very different spheres of governance. They, they were not one and the same. It wasn't like Iran. Um, but there was a very clear sense that everything that they were doing there served a higher purpose, a purpose for God, and that the state served the church and vice versa. And so, if, and they also had this firm belief in covenantal theology. So if, if there were some issues in the body politic, that threatened their whole experiment. So if, people so if people were unorthodox in their theology, they had to be expelled from the colony. Otherwise, it would threaten this great biblical commonwealth. So they were quite intolerant. They were not tolerant initially, but they were very big on creating a perfect society. So when we, so when we talk today about social justice stuff, transforming the world, um, the old congregationalists were very keen on that from the get-go because that's what they were trying to do. Um, and that's one of the things they've done throughout their entire history. Uh, that bit has not changed. So the Congregationalists come over, um, found Massachusetts and Connecticut. Uh, and if you know your history, then uh, in the 1640s, what happens is you have the English Civil War. And in the English Civil War, the Puritans win over in England. And they chop off King Charles's head in 1649. And they establish a commonwealth in England. Now, it turns out that people in England weren't so excited about being a Puritan commonwealth. <laughs> and by 1660, they actually welcomed uh, Charles' son, Charles II. So it was Charles I, because his head chopped off. Charles II invited in uh, to be king in 1660. And it became much less fashionable to be a Puritan. Meanwhile, of course, people stopped caring altogether about what was going on in Massachusetts and Connecticut. <laughs> um, so I think Bostonians, uh, being a Bostonian from birth, I can say this, Bostonians have always had an overinflated sense of their own importance. Um, and that goes right back to 1630. <laughs> um, and after the English Civil War, it's like, well, what are we doing here? There's this sort of crisis of identity going on in, in, in Boston, where, uh, again, there's lots of interesting stuff written about this. But the Congregationalists have to then figure out what, what, the, what they're going to do on their own uh, and how they're going to be themselves. So what are some things that are important about this period? Not, not just the sort of trying to make a perfect biblical commonwealth. Uh, they were always highly educated. Education was extremely important. Education was the path through which people found salvation. So uh, within the first few years, they established the very first high school in the United States, Boston Latin School. Uh, the next year, they established the first college in the United States, Harvard College. Uh, a few years later, they, they established the first mandatory public education act what became known as the Old Deluder Act, uh, where they required public education. By the time you get to the American Revolution, um, the literacy rates in New England were the highest that they were anywhere in the world. Uh, education mattered intensely to these early Congregationalists and to Congregationalists even to today. You have to be able to think, because you have to be able to think for yourself for your faith. That's the way salvation works. You have to be able to use your brain in order to do this. Um, that's why traditionally in the congregational world, people have preached with Geneva robes or academic gowns or, or, or the equivalent, because 
the clergy are those who are educated. It's one of the big things in educated clergy. Um, another big thing that comes up is uh, the congregationalists are not doctrinal. So there were never uh, creeds or platforms or that the congregationalists all had to, or confessions or creeds that all, all the congregationalists had to affirm. Um, each individual church set up its own requirements for membership. And so because you don't have any orthodoxy, because it's congregationally based, there are very few ways to actually enforce orthodoxy. So what that meant was all through congregational history, there's been this incredible theological engagement with whatever is the newest theological trend. And that goes right, right back to the 17th century. So people will say, oh, the old congregationalists, you had someone like Jonathan Edwards preaching sinners in the hands of the angry God in the 18th century. Very true. But in the 18th century, that was the leading edge of theology. In every era, they've been early adopters, if not leaders in whatever theological trends have come up since the, since the, 17, since the 1600s. Um, and part of that's because there is no orthodoxy imposed from on top. You can, each congregation can believe whatever it wants. So Horace Bushnell, um, who was the so-called father of American liberal theology, was a congregational minister in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, and I could go into details about him. Uh, so you see congregationalists in the 19th century embracing abolition and being leading abolitionists in the country. There's a reason why Lawrence, Kansas, you know, in the whole Kansas, Nebraska Act, Lawrence, Kansas is named Lawrence, Kansas after the Lawrence family in Massachusetts. The main drag in Lawrence, Kansas is called Massachusetts Avenue. There's still a congregational church at the end of Massachusetts Avenue. All goes back to uh, that time. Um, again, hardcore abolitionists, people like uh, Henry Beecher in Plymouth Church in Brooklyn, um, those who are interested in that kind of history. During the social gospel movement, congregationalists were at the forefront of the social gospel movement, trying to, uh, trying to address the ills of industrialism or industrialization um, in whatever way they could. Early adopters, again, of liberal theology. Um, and you see in the 20th century, early adopters of process theology, liberation theology, embracing the civil rights movement, obviously the gay rights movement, um, environmental rights movement. The congregations have been there from the get-go to the present day. And it all goes back to those early sort of defining features of the denomination. The history that was then is very much still the history now. Um, now, there's a lot more I could say about the congregationalists, but I think this would be a good time to pause and see if there are any questions about that tradition, because it's a pretty rich tradition and interesting one. Any questions about them? While their roots are Calvinist, they're not particularly Calvinist today. <laughs> if any of you are curious. Uh, yes, David, you have a question. Hi. This isn't really a question, but uh, go for it. I think most people kind of think of the Puritans and the Pilgrims as almost being the same. I mean, I think up until like 20 minutes ago, I thought that. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I was going to say something like uh, my mom used to be real into genealogy and well, not so much her, but her cousin and they traced all this stuff back and they found well we didn't come over on the mayflower but we came on over on the next ship <laughs> you know like 20 or 30 years ago and there's a book called saints and sinners which i don't know if you're familiar with yeah great book but we run across that a lot in the various houses that we go to collecting stuff from estate, estate sales and uh, you know there's some of our ancestors are listed in there not that i'm you know, it's a big deal for me. I think we were probably among the, the it's called Saints and Strangers, I guess. And I'm sure we were considered some of the strangers, you know. So, I mean, I don't think our family was probably ever very religious, but uh, it's just interesting to hear all this, um, you know, it, it, you know, and the fact that, you know, it's continued through the centuries, you know, I mean, I don't know. I guess I always thought of like the pilgrims. Oh yeah, that was like, and the and the Puritans was like, oh that's 
back in the 16, 1700s, and they don't really exist now, but I guess so, but maybe not under that name. So it's good to good to know, and it's good to know their progressive history. Yeah, so the, it, it's interesting to note that there's a couple, a few things what you said, David. Um, first is between 1630 and 1650, uh, there were 20,000 people who emigrated from England to Massachusetts and Connecticut, 20,000, uh, which is immensely large. I mean, this is a huge migration of people that came over during this time period. Um, and again, there was, a, there was an oppression going on in England. There was a civil war going on in England. There were a lot of people who wanted to find a new way and something else, <clears throat> and that led to this huge migration. And this migration of people, uh, these folks, when they arrived uh, over the following 100 years, had the highest reproductive rate in the world and the lowest infant mortality rate in the world. So they bred like rabbits, literally. Uh, you go back and see these family trees from the 1600s, and each generation's got 10, 12 kids, and they're almost all living to adulthood, and they're all having 10, 12 kids. Um, and they're doing this every 20 years. So um, there's this explosion of population coming out of New England, uh, coming out of this period, um, which leads to a lot of New Englanders settling in the upper Midwest, um, upstate New York, uh, upstate, and then again, the upper Midwest, and then eventually all the way out to the California coast. So the congregationalists brought their churches with them as they moved uh, out west. Um, and so it's interesting to see some of those settlement patterns. So there are a lot of people who can claim descent from that original Great Migration, and particularly people who are from Massachusetts, because Massachusetts for a long time um, was not, um, how should we put this? Uh, they maintained a certain amount of ethnocentrism uh, that's uh, not a flattering characteristic. So uh, if you know anything about early, if you know anything about Boston, Boston, the Boston Protestants were not particularly kind to the Irish Catholics when they came over in the 1840s and afterwards. Um, there was very much all these signs about sort of the Irish need not apply in Boston. And so within Massachusetts, uh, it was quite common for these descendants of the English Puritans to all to keep marrying one another and not marry any of these relatively new arrivals. So until, especially my parents or my grandparents' generation, um, if you met someone who was uh, Protestant, they almost could always name all of their descendants came back came over in the Great Migration. Uh, so it's quite common in Eastern Massachusetts to have people who all of whose ancestors came over in 1635. Uh, that's not unusual at all um, in Eastern Massachusetts because of the sort of unusual settlement patterns of that area. Um, one note about the Puritans and Pilgrims that's interesting. Um, the, even though the Pilgrims were historically far less significant, um, there's an interesting debate about their influence and their role. Um, the Pilgrims, again, there was a separate colony. Plymouth Colony was separate from the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, the, the colony, the colonial charters were revoked in 1685 um, by the King of England, King James, and forming uh, called the, something called the Dominion of New England. All the colonies of New England were all smushed together uh, until the Glorious Revolution a couple of years later. And then, you know, these, the colonial charters were restored in certain ways in Massachusetts at that, in that restoration period in 1691. Plymouth was then absorbed into Massachusetts Bay. But until that period, it was an independent colony. And Plymouth was a place that um, they actually, they were far more democratic in their approach to things. Uh, and they were far more tolerant than the Puritans were. Um, the sort of intolerance of the Puritans and the Puritan Commonwealth was not true in Plymouth. Uh, so Plymouth, so for instance, when the Quakers were making inroads into New England, uh, they had uh, a, a much more safety and shelter in the areas that were overseen by Plymouth. Uh, than they did once they crossed the border and went into Massachusetts Bay. Um, the, so there were, and there's some interesting conversations about how the tolerance of Plymouth or the congregational governance of Plymouth might have, might have impacted the Puritans. Um, but in general, the Puritans are far more important historically than the Pilgrims, uh, at least until the 19th century. Any other questions about the fascinating subject of the congregationalists? Yeah, Henry? Oh, you're, you're, you're muted, Henry, I can't hear you. Is this how the congregational church slowly become more inclusive? Because at the very beginning, they don't even accept Irish people. But <laughs> the beginning, they don't accept Baptists. They don't accept any of them. They gave boot out Roger Williams for being a Baptist. Uh, right, so, so the first Baptist they, church in the United so, States. Mm -hmm. Now they are so acceptive of every. Is how how long did it take for them to change their philosophy from being exclusivity to inclusivity? 
did, did it go for centuries or so? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, it's hard to answer. Because uh, part of it depends on how, what, what you mean by inclusive. Um, um, Accepting the, uh, CLBT folks, for example, embracing yeah, I mean that, uh, the again, slaves was, to try to abolish slavery. Yeah, all that stuff is very early on. Um, I mean, that stuff goes back. Um, I, but there's always, it's, again, it's, it's an odd tradition where um, I think particularly the, 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 the congregational churches outside New England have always been much more open. Uh, so one of, the, one of the first schools that they established, um, one of the early schools they established is Oberlin College in Ohio. And, you know, when Oberlin was established, it was established on a radical education model. Um, it was one of the first colleges to have uh, women who were involved. Uh, it, it, was in, it was around that area where, it was, where the, first, the first woman ordained in the United States was ordained in the congregational tradition. Um, and so the, um, I mean, the congregationalists, particularly outside New England, uh, were far more progressive than some of those congregationalists that remained in New England, who tended to maintain a little bit more stodginess. Uh, but when you got outside there, it was a it was, it was a different thing, um, and that's you see as the congregation as as the, as the tradition develops that um, even though the sort of pilgrims become an important identifying factor uh, in the 19th century as the nominational awareness uh, increases, um, that's not that's not necessarily exclusionary in the 19th century if that makes any sense. So um, I don't know. It's it, but it's always been a, a sort of English denomination, just like the Lutherans were a German denomination. Um, you know, the congregationalists were always very closely tied to that image of, I mean, especially outside New England, these churches are trying to identify themselves. And so, so many of them are called Plymouth Church or they're called Pilgrim Church. You know, some of the UCC churches in this area are still called Plymouth and Pilgrim. You go any part of the country and they have these names uh, to try as a, as a sort of identifying factor um, of what it means to be a congregationalist. These days, of course, it's far less relevant. Um, but anyway, lots of interesting stuff. Um, let's 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 move on a little bit and look at some of these that the three other traditions. I don't want to dwell too much on the congregational one <laughs> because there's some interesting stuff. Um, so the congregationalist is one thing, but there's another uh, another one of the denominations, uh, the smallest of the four that came together, uh, is this group called the Christian Connection. Um, and this is a denomination that arose. Um, it arose in the post-American Revolutionary War period. So those of you who are good, who are good American religious history scholars know that the American Revolution had a tremendous impact on uh, American religious, re religious right. And in fact, the, the, the flowering of the Methodists uh, is very much a second great awakening phenomenon, post-American Revolution phenomenon. Um, in this period, you have the, the West, so to speak, what we would call the Midwest, opening up to settlement for the first time. So all of a sudden they're, people going out there to settle new churches and settle new lands. Um, and on that frontier, um, people didn't take too kindly to the religion of the East Coast establishment. So the frontier religion was very, very different from the religion on the East Coast establishment. In fact, a lot of people who hated that religion went to the frontier intentionally because they wanted to get away from the stuffiness of the congregations, the Presbyterians, the Dutch Reformed Church in New, in, in New York, uh, the Church of England Church, uh, Church of England and some of the Southern colonies. Um, and so on the frontier, there was a very different environment. And the second denomination is a denomination that grows up out of this frontier experience, uh, grows up out of this post-American Revolution experience and the crucible of the Second Great Awakening. So the Second Great Awakening um, usually is dated to eight, its start to 1800, uh, be, begins to peter out in the 1830s, is hands down the single most important religious movement in American history. Um, potentially the modern day evangelical movement might come close, but I would say they don't. Um, <laughs> I mean, the second great awakening gives birth to what it means to be American in terms of, in terms of its religious identity in every, in every possible way. Uh, the Mormons are, you know, a second great awakening movement. Well, one of these denominations gets this name Christian and, uh, it arises independently in three different areas, right on this frontier, right around the same time at the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th centuries. The first of these moments actually is Methodist if you can believe it. So someone by the name of James O'Kelly, uh, who was a Methodist preacher, uh, circuit riding preacher in Virginia, North Carolina. Uh, early Methodist, this guy was president at the Christmas conference in 1784. Um, and in 1792, when the Methodists in the United States are organizing themselves into a conference, um, O'Kelly was uh, one of the leading proponents against giving Thomas Cook and Francis Asbury um, basically uh, near dictatorial power. Um, he wanted to have a democratic Methodist church. 
um, based in Wesleyan principles, but not based in an Episcopal structure. And so O'Kelly actually left the Methodists in 1792 to establish his own denomination uh, that he originally called Re Republican Methodists. <laughs> and then uh, two years later ended up adopting just the simple name Christian. And this is one of these themes that comes up in this denomination uh, where this frontier denomination says, the only thing that you need to be a member is to just have good Christian character. That this is a denomination that says, we're not gonna be like those you know, pompous people on the East Coast. We're not gonna require fancy degrees. We're not gonna require some, some you know, confessions that you jump through various hoops or come, or come up with tokens to go get your communion. Uh, no, you just, you're Christian, you got Christian character, you show up, good enough for all of us. Um, so the first of these sort of Christian movements uh, is you know, in, in Virginia and North Carolina uh, coming out of James O. Kelly's movement. The second one, not that far away, uh, over in Kentucky, uh, started by a guy named Barton Stone. Um, Stone was grew in the Presbyterian world and is best known for uh, being a major player in the Cane Ridge Revival of 1801, which is, you read histories of the Second Great Awakening. This is where, uh, you know, this was, this, was, this was written about because you had people in this like ecstatic sort of moments of the spirit and it had like 20,000 people there. Um, and Barton Stone is right, in the, right at the center of this. <clears throat> and so he's one of these people who left the Presbyterian church and started this church. And again, it's like the only thing that matters is just be Christian. You have a good, solid uh, experience. Obviously, this, the, the sort of Barton Stone movement, the Stone movement um, has a more revivalistic character uh, than some of the others. But it's all about, are you a good Christian? Um, the Stone movement, in, in, you know, interestingly, ends up... Um, almost joining with and some parts joining with Alexander Campbell and the Disciples of Christ uh, in the early 1830s. So they're very, they're very you know, close connection there between this stone movement and uh, the Campbellites. The third sort of bit of these Christians starts at, in Northern New England. And again, the New England establishment is around Boston and, and Connecticut. But in the Northern reaches of New England in parts of New Hampshire and then into Vermont, they have a very different way of doing things. And actually there were two people there um, Abner Jones, and I'm trying to the other guy, uh, who ended up established, who ended up be former Baptists. But even for them, the Baptists were too strict. The Baptists required, you know, adult baptism. And these Christians are like, nope, we're not going to require that. If you want to do a sacrament, great. If you don't, great. If you want to do immersion, great. If you want to do sprinkling, great. Kids, great. We're not getting involved in those controversies. We're just going to be Christian. No controversies. It's pretty radical. <laughs> <laughs> very American. Um, and this group of people uh, ended up establishing the first religious periodical in the United States, the Herald of Gospel Liberty in 1808. And in 1810, these three disparate groups uh, had become known about, you know, knew about one another, ended up forming this Christian connection, as they called it. Uh, and it was always a loosely affiliated movement. Um, and over time, there were basic principles that they sort of identified with. One was uh, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. He's the sole authority in the church. So no bishops, no nothing else, just Jesus. Uh, that Christian character is the sort of sole judge by which people can join the church. That the Bible is all you need. You don't need any fancy education or anything else. If you just pick up a Bible and read it, you're all good. Um, there's no creeds. Uh, so that re re respecting radically the conscience of each individual believer. Um, uh, unity in Christ, and just one other principle, I remember, but there's this basic Christian movement where it's pretty radical. There's even like one stuff that <laughs> I get a kick out of this. So there's certain people in this group that they they, 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 they didn't want to be hamstrung by tradition. So uh, after meetings, they would like burn the minutes of their meetings because we don't want to be, we don't want to be, you know, held back by what we did before. It's brand new each time, you know, we're just Christians, you know, <laughs> no tradition. Um, and apparently some congregations were more Unitarian, some congregations were more Trinitarian, that doesn't matter, you know? And because of this, and again, James O'Kelly early on, the, the former Methodist, was a leading um, abolitionist in Virginia and North Carolina back in the day. Um, and so this Christian connection uh, ends up attracting a number of African-Americans and actually has, there's, it becomes this black Christian connection in the South. And, you know, the, the Christian connection, unfortunately, starts to splinter over slavery in the 1840s, eventually gets back together, sort of like the Methodists, um, but they sort of splinter over slavery. And after the Civil War, you end up having, you have, end up having an independently organized 
African Christian, Afro-Christian connection, as they call themselves. So this, these, these churches that go back a long ways that are African-American churches uh, in North Carolina. To this day, there are churches in the UCC in North Carolina that go from this Afro-Christian tradition, um, which I find fascinating. So you had this Christian tradition that then again, unifies again in the, in, in the 1890s and uh, eventually decides in the 1920s uh, in the great sort of ecumenical movement that I'll talk about next week of the mid 20th century to join with the Congregationalists. So the Congregationalists joined with the Christian churches in 1931 to form the Congregational Christian churches. Now this is easy because they're all congregational and they're, and they're non-doctrinal, non-credal. But it's still kind of odd where you have a denomination that originally grew up in, resp in, in negative response to people like the Congregationalists eventually joining with the Congregationalists. But you know that's the thing about American Christianity. It's, it's crazy, it's weird. <laughs> History changes things. <laughs> so that's sort of a basic sketch of the Christian, very loosely affiliated, radical democracy, freedom of conscience, um, so there's sort of the second strand. And we can move on to the, the, the next strand because I, I, I want to be respectful to this time. So next strand is uh, the German Reformed Church. Now Reformed with a capital R is sort of code for Calvinists. So it's the German Calvinists. So if you look at German geography on the west coast of Germany, again, right near you have this, the whole Rhine River Valley. And that Rhine River Valley um, became, you know, again, from Geneva all the way up, even though it's on, and from Geneva all the way up to uh, the Netherlands, that whole area um, became sort of the Calvinist corridor. <laughs> you've got the Dutch Reformed Church, you've got the German Reformed Church, you've got the Swiss Reformed Church, Swiss Calvinist Church. Um, and that area of Germany, uh, again, most of the rest of Germany is predominantly Lutheran or predominantly Catholic, that area was Calvinist. And that area was also the scenes of a lot of destruction during the War of Spanish Secession. Uh, in the early 18th century. And so you have waves of German immigrants leaving that area. Some go to England first, others just go straight to the United States. And you have these German immigrants fleeing desperate circumstances um, in Western Germany, what, in what is today Western Germany. Germany, of course, wasn't a unified country then, in order to come to uh, the United States. And many of these end up in Eastern Pennsylvania. Many of these Germans end up in Eastern Pennsylvania. Um, again, a lot of these Pennsylvania settlers were there because William Penn welcomed them in to his colony, um, and the descendants of William Penn were welcoming to his colony. So you have this, you know, again, that's where you have, still this day, you have got a lot of, you got a lot of Lutheran churches and other sort of German influence, the Pennsylvania Dutch, so to speak, um, are there. And part of this group were people, some of the people who came there were Reformed, were Calvinists. But unlike the Congregationalists, when these people arrived, they didn't have any money. They didn't have any education. I mean, they had basic education, they were educated people, but they didn't have fancy university degrees. And they didn't have any clergy either. Because what clergy person wants to go over and hang out with you know, sort of the poor people eking it out on the frontier in Eastern Pennsylvania in the 18th century? So initially this group of German reform folks, they just, they, they, they were allowed in the Heidelberg Catechism, which is their sort of foundational theological document. And they would do lots of, I mean, they would do like home teaching and they would try and maintain their, their reformed communities just on their own without clergy. I mean, they started, they started settling there in the 17 teens and 20s. It wasn't until the 1740s that the first ordained person showed up to organize these churches more formally. And actually before then, and for, the, for most of the 18th century, they relied on the organizational structure of the Dutch Reformed Church in, uh, in New York City in order to help organize the churches, uh, the German churches in Eastern Pennsylvania. And so the German churches in Eastern Pennsylvania, these German Reformed churches became their own denomination separate from the Dutch only in 1793. And again, kept growing as more and more German settlements came and they ended up expanding. Uh, and moving into the 19th century, moved out, in, moved out westward into Ohio um, and the upper Midwest. So to this day, there are a lot of UCC churches in, in Pennsylvania. And these are all old German Reformed churches. And these churches are, are, are much more structured than the Congregationalists. The Congregationalists uh, are sort of, let's, <laughs> let's just let things roll. Whereas the German Reforms are much more good Presbyterians. I mean, they're good Reformed folks. Uh, there's stuff has to be done just so in a way that uh, the Congregationalists are a little more, 
Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> They're a little more flexible on the congregational side. The Dutch reform side is a little different. And one of the interesting things about how it's relevant for today, this might be interesting for people at Bering, um, in the middle of the 19th century, the seminary of the German Reformed Church, which by that time they called themselves the Reformed Church of the United States, uh, the seminary of that denomination was based in Mercersburg, Pennsylvania. Now it's in Lancaster, but then it was in Mercersburg, Pennsylvania. And there were these two incredibly bright scholars at Mercersburg at the time, John Williams, John Williams and Nevin and Philip Schaff, who were there, that ended up you know, creating this theology known as this Mercersburg movement, this Mercersburg theology. And what's so interesting about it is it was, um, it was basically the American response to the, to the Oxford movement, for those of you who are familiar with that. So this was a much more high church thing that looked at church history. Philip Schaff is a very famous church historian, looked at church history, uh, and made an argument for the sort of the continuity of Christian history from its earliest days to the present. Now, for a lot of Protestants, that was not done. Usually it was like the early church was great, then sin, and then, yep. Oh. Yep, oh, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> as soon as I mentioned sin, like all of a sudden my, my, my screen goes black because it's like, stop mentioning that. Um, but so mo most Protestants are like, oh, there's this big black area in the Middle Ages that only gets better you know, post-Reformation. Here, Philip Schaff and, 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 and Nevin, John Nevin, arguing that, no, 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 you have this incredible tradition, and the tradition is there. The sacraments are great, that there's this high sort of church tradition growing out of the Mercersburg movement that's there in, uh, and again, it's there in the UCC. So this, this, this sort of love of liturgy, love of order, love of the sacraments, um, and the sort of continuity of the Christian tradition is there in that part of the UCC. So it's not just this congregational part, that stuff's there too. And it's a fascinating movement to read about. Um, now, you have this German Reformed Church that's spreading out, you have, uh, but you have multiple waves of German immigration. Those of you who know about German history, in the 19th century, you have these waves of Germans who start coming over to the United States and settling in the Midwest. And some of them are reformed and become part of the German Reformed Church, but they're all German speaking. By that point, the old school German Reformed are English speaking. So all of a sudden there's these debates over German language. Um, but you have this other group that settled in the Midwest, um, and they form what's become, what becomes known as the Evangelical Synod. So if you know your German history, again, in, in, in Prussia, uh, in the early 19th century, the King of Prussia uh, forcibly brought together the German Reformed Church that was there and the Lutheran Church there to form this uh, Evangelical Union Church in Prussia. Um, that church, uh, a lot of people from that area, uh, the sort of mirror church in the United States was this evangelical synod. And they were founded in part with help from these missionaries from Basel, Switzerland. Uh, these Basel missionaries were uh, sort of uh, evangelizing all over the world. And some of them evangelized these Germans in the Midwest, and they were German speaking themselves. Um, and they ended up starting this evangelical union church in uh, outside of St. Louis, Missouri, uh, in Missouri. And if, if you've ever wondered why the Missouri Synod Lutherans are so conservative, the reason why they're so conservative is because you had these others who are competing there who also claimed Lutheran heritage, um, but were much more wishy-washy <laughs> in terms of their adherence to Lutheran principles. So the Lutherans in, in, in Missouri were like, oh no, we're going to double down on Lutherism and be the most hardcore Lutherans you'll find anywhere, uh, because you don't want to be mixed up with these sort of folks who have uh, the influence of the German Reformed Church and these other sort of, uh, <laughs> these, these, these other notions. This evangelical synod church spread up and down the, the sort of Mississippi River. And these are the people that started to settle in Texas. So the UCC churches that are in Texas were all evangelical synod churches. And some of them go back to the mid 19th century as German immigrants came into Texas. That's the UCC element here. Uh, the UCC church that's over on Long Point Road has a worship space that was built in the 1860s that they still use today. The church that's, you know, the church that's in the middle of Sam Houston Park, St. John, that was a German church. That was a UCC church. St. John is still, uh, is, congregation is still around. So that aspect of the UCC, these goes back to that same German immigrants who, from what I understand it, helped found Bering as well. Um, although they were different, denom different denominations, that same sort of wave of immigrants. And that second wave of German immigrants became this evangelical synod group. Out of that group come Reinhold and Nature's Niebuhr. And the German evangelical synod and the German reformed end up merging together in 1934 to form the Evangelical Reformed Church, the ENR Church. And it's those that then come together with the congregationalists to form the UCC. Um, 
So that's sort of like basic sketch. Um, I wonder if there are any questions people have. I went really quickly through a lot of history. Uh, I feel like I'm the teacher in Ferris Bueller's Day Off and like just droning on about historical stuff. Uh, I find it fascinating. I, it just the very uniting of that kind of diversity is is really fascinating to me. I mean that 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 the UCC could figure out how to pull that kind of diversity together in a form of unity that allows that that freedom, you know, for all of that to exist in a, and yet have a focus around covenant, have focus around justice and uh, so yeah, I I learned a lot. I didn't know any, most of that. I didn't know. <laughs> the, the, the evolution of the story is fascinating because the how things developed then through the 20th century into the 21st century, um, you know, I, I, I it's it, again, I, I find historically it's fascinating. It's also important to note that these four traditions make up the UCC, um, but there was even diversity within some of the traditions. For instance, there were a whole group of German Congregationalists. It wasn't a very big group, but they existed. Um, then there were, just like with you know, the Methodists, there were these churches. I mean, the, the very first foreign missionary organization in the United States was the American Board of Commissioners of Foreign Missions, established in 1810 slash 1812. Um, that group eventually became a solely congregational organ, and it's still around today uh, and part of the UCC. So the American Board went to Hawaii. So if you go to Hawaii, there are these native Hawaiian churches that are UCC churches. Um, you have in Texas, you have a congregation that's Filipino UCC that's now merged into Grace UCC, and you have a Korean UCC church um, in Houston. Um, I mean, there's, there's, there is this incredible diversity of the UCC that you sort of find more out more about as we sort of go further along in the story. Uh, Gary? You're, you're still muted, Gary. I wanted to um, ask if you would uh, help me remember uh, some of Wesley's background. Uh, if I get this wrong, uh, correct me. Uh, but uh, his grandfather, for whom he was named, also John Wesley, was a non-conforming uh, minister in the in England, uh, which uh, uh, I think I'm, I'm trying to say uh, wasn't a real smooth process of going from uh, the um, um, uh, Reformation in, uh, in England to reestablishment of the Church of England. And there was a lot of suspicion about the people who remained Calvinist in their orientation. And they had to keep their windows open when they worshiped so that people could look inside and see what they were doing. And uh, John Wesley's uh, grandfather was uh, a nonconforming uh, uh, priest and, and actually got removed from his vicarate. And John Wesley himself was uh, um, uh, pretty controversial at, in the early uh, stages of his career because he was preaching to people outside of churches and in fields and things like that. And so uh, this kind of nonconformity is not uh, is not uh, unusual in, in the Methodist uh, tradition that we are from. And we have a little bit of a Calvinist and evangelical bent, uh, perhaps as a result of that. So. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, again, I mean, I mean look at look at uh, John Bunyan, uh, and he was a nonconformist Baptist. Um, but yeah, the sort of Baptist congregations, Presbyterians, all nonconformists um, in that period. Any other questions that people have? So as a non-conforming congregation, I think this sounds like it might be a good fit. <laughs> we've kind of yeah, always I mean, we've kind of always pushed the edge, you know. <laughs> so. Well, another interesting thing. I mean, again, we'll talk next week about the uniting movement, the uniting church movement around the world, and it's you know it's it's American uh, example. But in in Canada, the United Church of Canada is um, the Canadian Methodists with the Canadian Congregationalists and Canadian Presbyterians to form the United Church of Canada. Um, so they were sort of the nonconformists of Canada formed the UCC of uh, Canada, um, which is what happens that the United Church movement in the United States took, took on a different form. Um, so, but again, that's, that's the story for next week. Uh, <laughs> uh, I guess so the last thing I'll say about coming back to the Congregationalists just for a moment. Um, the Congregationalists didn't really ha did not have a denomination until 1871. Sort of an interesting little factoid. Uh, 
Um, they, again, they were so congregational in their orientation, the very fact of having a denomination or denominational structure seemed anti-congregationalist. So it was only in response to their growing other denominations and the effectiveness of other denominations that led to the formation of a national congregational uh, denomination. Um, and even though the congregationalists were very predominantly very theologically liberal, there were always pockets of conservatism within the congregational tradition. And in the early 20th century, um, as the national church established a council for social action in the 1930s to deal with the issues of the depression, that was, uh, even though, because before local congregations could be as progressive as they wanted, uh, and the conservatives were perfectly happy because they, they, they loved that Puritan pilgrim stuff. That was their heritage. Well, when the Council of Social Action started making statements and doing things on behalf of the Congregationalists nationally, then these conservatives got a little, little upset. In 1948, they split off and formed uh, the Conservative Congregational Christian Churches of the United States, which is only a couple percent of the denomination. But if you go to Boston, on Boston Common is Park Street Church, this big white steeple congregational church. That was one of the founding members of those fundamentalist wing of the Congregationalists. So yes, there were fundamentalist Congregationalists, <laughs> even though it was a very small minority of the group. Uh, Gerald, you have a question? Uh, you're, you're muted, Gerald. Let's see. In the right hand corner. Should be up in the right hand corner of your screen and your image. Carol, are you on your iPhone? Just hit the just hit the screen and it, it should come up on the bottom. Oh, there we go. You had it. Diane, you can you you can also unmute him as the host. It's telling me ask to unmute, and it doesn't seem to be letting me unmute him. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I was wondering about that because there is a church in Baytown that calls itself the Congregational Methodist Church, and some and people were telling me it was a very it was a conservative. Um, um, congregational group, but I thought the name was quite interesting. Uh, I had driven by it uh, multiple times when I lived there, and I was a little curious, curious about that, uh, <clears throat> especially coming from a Methodist background. Um, but my parents uh, and my brother, who's a retired Methodist minister, used to talk about also to the German Methodists that they were a little bit different. That the um, where the United came from from the United Methodist Church, a lot of those have a had a German background. Um, the, so I was uh, yeah I was a little but yeah your history was interesting because I, I I'm kind of a historian historian not religious of nature but historian so you you were filling in some gaps that I I knew some about but you were filling in some real interesting gaps. Good. I'm glad. Uh, yeah. No. The uh, well. The next class we'll talk about this sort of splits in the congregational world. <laughs> so Rick, some... Rick, do you want to be the last person to speak? Can you unmute? Yes. <clears throat> Pardon me. I'm just curious. When did they start after this mergers <clears throat> from different churches becoming congregational? When did they actually use UCC? So we'll, we'll, we'll talk all about that um, next week. Um, but but so the, as, as a teenager, I grew up in a congregational church. Okay, and okay. at that time, it was just congregational. But later right. on, and I, I you know, moved away from town, but later on, it became U, uh, congregational UCC. And I just wondered when it, the UCC you started. You mind if I ask what, uh, what part of the country it, the church is? A uh, little town of Warren in Indiana. OK. so. Uh, as, as we'll talk about next week, this, uh, there was quite a bit of controversy <laughs> as the denomination was formed. And um, the German side of the denomination, the ENR church, uh, once, the once the merger happened and they voted because it's got Presbyterian polity, it was binding on all the churches, and then they changed all their names. Boom, like that. 
as opposed to being St. John ENR, they became St. John UCC. Names were changed, everything was great. Uh, the Congregationalists um, had a different approach. <laughs> <laughs> well, and again, in, that's, in later that's, years, yeah. in later years, I went to the Plymouth Church, Congregational mm -hmm. Plymouth. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's uh, again, there's there's, there's there's a lot to be said about that next week. And, and again, it, it tells a lot about the denomination, um, pros and cons. But it, yeah. All right. Well, thank you, John. That was really interesting. I, that's a lot of history. I like history too. And uh, so. Um, we appreciate your time and hopefully all of you all can come back next week and we'll learn some more. And if you think of questions, you know, uh, you can email me or something and I can forward them to John if there's something particularly you want, you want to know about that's sparked your interest and uh, he'll, he'll keep moving us forward through history. And uh, so. Yeah. No, and, I, and just, just to emphasize, I mean, again, the, the, the classes in the next few weeks are really the ones that, that talk more specifically about the denomination today and what that means. Um, I mean, I think this early history is important to give some of the background and some of those early themes and where they come from. But the next few weeks, you'll see um, the real character of the United Church of Christ as the denomination unfold. Uh, so, Thank yeah, you. I, I hope, ho I, I hope you come back. I'm really excited because to me, the more I learn, the more the fit for bearing just seems like a natural, very natural thing. So.